So today we pick up with chapter 13 on money and banking. And of course, this is the subsection 13.1, where we're going to try to get in and define what money is. Now, you wouldn't think defining money would be a big deal, but it turns out this will be very important for farther down the road to understand the underlying principle of what money is, not just what we accept as money in our particular society. So let's remind ourselves what money is for. It's a tool that greatly simplifies market transactions because what it does is it avoids barter. Now, um, exchange existed long before money was ever invented. And of course, barter is the direct exchange of one good for another without the use of money. And you know, people do barter things even today in, in a modern society. But what money does by acting as a medium of exchange what you end up doing is you eliminate the need for both parties to have a good that the other party wants. Now all you need to have is one party has the good that the other one wants, but then the other party has money, which becomes essentially a general good. Even though it's not a physical good that anyone wants for its own sake, the money is useful for getting anything that you do want. So money ends up becoming what's called the medium of exchange, and pretty much everyone accepts it, rather than asking you to bring them something that you truly want. Now let's go take a look at um, what the money supply would be for our particular um, country. But before we get into that, which we'll be doing on the next couple slides, let's think about the types of money and what can serve as money. Because it turns out that there's more than one form of money that is in existence at any one time. So the first thing that money has to solve is three major issues. It has to be a medium of exchange, which we've already discussed, meaning it has to be accepted for payment for goods and services and for debts as well. So it, it settles transactions. The next thing, money should serve as a store of value. In other words, you should be able to, let's think about saving for your retirement. Um, I mean, say you want to eat um, eggs and bacon for breakfast when you're retired. So you're no longer working. Um, so you have nothing physical to exchange for these things. So you're going to what? build a refrigerator and keep eggs and bacon for the next 30 years to store it up for when you retire. Now, of course, I deliberately picked that example to show how ridiculous it is to try to save for the future in physical commodities. What you really want to do is save for the future in some kind of money so that when you get to the point where you're in your 60s, you go out shopping for stuff that's, you know, eggs are only a couple days old when you go shopping for them, even though you're now retired and no longer looking to exchange good for goods. So anyway, money should serve as a store of value into the future. And then last but not least, it should serve as a standard of value. In other words, just like tape measures measure physical distances and scales measure weight, money measures value. Now, money doesn't create the value. The value is the desirability of the product. What does it do for you? What problems does it solve for you? So air conditioning is valuable because it removes humidity and heat. So that's what gives air conditioning its value. How much you're willing to pay for an air conditioner tells you how much you value the air conditioning. So at that point, the price is measuring how much you value the air conditioning. Now, in the modern times, we have um, some relatively modern forms of money. Uh, cash is actually reasonably modern in the sense of paper money. Uh, before, if you go back, let's, uh, if you're a Bible reader, um, you know, the Bible has, uh, goes all the way back to the Jewish nation um, a couple thousand years ago. If you read the Bible, uh, there's constant references to gold money, silver money, copper money. Uh, so the, the ancient Jews understood money, and they weren't the only ones. I'm just pointing out a particularly ancient book, but we know from historical examples, the ancient Chinese had money. But paper money is a relatively, for, from common use, is relatively modern. Although the Chinese did have paper money pretty far back, it wasn't available for, uh, for ordinary people. So anyway, uh, cash is a modern form of money, but clearly not as uh, modern as some other forms, such as checking accounts. Uh, banks have existed for long periods of time, and wealthy business people and merchants had access to checking accounts. But for ordinary people, that's a relatively recent phenomenon that you could um, write a check and actually hand the check to somebody in return for a physical commodity. Um, online payment systems and credit cards are not money. Because remember, a credit card, while you can use it to spend, 
a credit card taps into essentially a prior existing loan document. So when you sign up for your credit card, you're essentially signing a loan. And now the amount of dollar amounts of the loan vary depending on how many things you charge, unlike a car loan where you know the amount up front when you sign the paperwork. Um, credit cards are referred to as revolving credit. You pay it off at certain amounts, you take out you know, more loans on it at a certain amount. So a credit card actually is not money, even though it looks like money. And then going back to the previous um, um, bullet point, a debit card, which physically looks almost identical to a credit card, especially nowadays, they, they're really hard to tell apart, but a debit card taps into your checking account and your checking account is measured in money, right? So a debit card represents money, whereas a credit card represents debt. Just so you will recognize when we start adding up how much actual money is in existence, we don't add up the credit cards. And then, of course, uh, the essence of money is not its physical form, but its ability to purchase goods and services. So, uh, with, you know, with this Apple Pay and all the kinds of, of, of mechanisms to tap into money, they become less and less physical and more and more abstract. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at how the government keeps track of these things. Now, we have, a, we have one definition called M1, which stands for Money Supply 1. And this will be the first definition of money. It's the most obvious definition because it fits all criteria that we listed, the medium of exchange, the store of value, and the unit of account to measure value. So cash and transactions accounts, meaning physical cash, printed paper money, and money in your checking account are considered to be transactions accounts because you can access your check account uh, immediately. Well, as long as you have your checkbook with you, no matter where you are, you can write a check and you can instantly get access to it. Or you can use your, de use your debit card pretty much anywhere and get instant access. The same as if you had the cash in your wallet, right? So M1, let's go make through a list now. Your M1 would include all your checking account balances, traveler's checks balances, currency balances held by the public. All of that added together is M1. Now, as a practical matter, traveler's checks have declined quite dramatically. Um, if you go back to the 1970s, before computers were powerful enough to provide instant transaction with a debit card at the actual point of sale, uh, especially for foreign travel, uh, people, because uh, obviously no foreigner is going to accept your personal check. There's no way for them to track you down if, you're, if the check is bad. Traveler's checks used to be significantly more um, important. Today, they're a much, much more minor part of the total money system, but they're still being counted as part of money because they're instantly usable as a medium of exchange. So remember, the M1 permits direct payment to a third party for goods or services, so clearly it counts as money. Now, we have another definition that is close to being money, and many people consider it to be money. It's called M2. And M2 includes M1, plus we add a few other things, such as savings accounts and money market, mutual money market funds. Now, I think everyone can recognize that savings accounts are pretty darn close to being money. They, you, if, if you're out shopping, can you just tap into your savings account at your grocery store? No. So is it really transactions money? Not quite but it's pretty darn close. I presume most of you all nowadays probably pay your bills online with uh, you know, your, ba your bank provides an online banking system. I don't know about yours, but mine lets me tap into my savings account with maybe two clicks. I, on, I, I can, from one page to another, I can transfer money from savings into checking. So a lot of times I keep uh, you know, only a small amount in my checking account and most of my money sits in my savings account. And then I just make transfers during the month whenever I need to tap up, you know, top up the uh, checking account. Do you all do the same? Well, if you do, then you recognize that savings accounts have become something pretty darn close to being money. So many economists prefer to include them as part of the money supply, but they break it out into this secondary definition. So the M1 definition, everyone agrees, is absolutely money. The M2 definition is, okay, we're including the M1, plus we're adding this thing that's pretty darn close to money. And the same thing, of course, is true for money market mutual funds. Um, I don't know how many of you all have one, but uh, a lot of them actually permit you to write checks on them. So in many ways, these what they're really technically investments, but they're investments that are so close to money that for practical purposes, we can treat them as money. So 
Um, M2, well, it has to be turned into M1 before it can be used to purchase good or service. The conversion is so quick and easy that for practical purposes, it's part of our purchasing power. Okay. And this becomes important. We start trying to talk about aggregate demand and try to figure out what is the demand for goods and services in the entire economy. Well, the M2 is one of the most prominent um, things that we keep, uh, keep an eye on to see how much spending power people have. So think of it that way. M2 is measuring our purchasing power. Now, in this last slide, in this particular um, subsection, let's take a look at um, the two different um, versions of money, the M1 version and the M2 version. The M1 version is the first column on the left. You see that there is um, uh, uh, transactions accounts. Uh, that would be the, uh, what, your checking account is around three, tr these are in billions. So 3,000 billion is three trillion. So three trillion, four hundred forty-four billion dollars worth of checking account balances and currency in circulation is about 1.8 trillion. So about half the level of what the um, uh, checking account balances are. Because nowadays, very few of us carry that much cash around with us. So you would not expect currency to be as large as your checking account balance. But the two of them added together make up $5,329,000,000 worth of direct transactable money, which we call M1. Now, the M2 definition of money, which is so, so close to M1 that many economists actually prefer it, um, you add in the savings accounts, money market mutual funds, and then all of a sudden you skyrocket from $5 trillion approximately all the way up to $18 trillion. So you see that the savings accounts and the money market funds together are dramatically larger than the checking account balances and the cash balances. So if you want to take a look at what's the total purchasing power in our economy, how much total money do we have to spend? We have roughly $18,327,000,000,000 worth of immediate purchasing power, or at least something so close to immediate purchasing power, we're going to treat it as immediate purchasing power. So that's what the total um, demand in our um, so the ability to purchase in our system is. So we'll pick up on our next um, slide deck on the next issue that we're going to be dealing with.